Good afternoon. My name's Carl Matheson. I'm a reporter with Politico, and thank you for joining us for this discussion uh, on whether the COVID-19 pandemic has, in fact, brought Europe's climate goals closer within reach. Uh, first of all, some housekeeping. Don't hesitate to uh, use the Swapcard app to submit your questions during this discussion, and I'd be happy to read them out and ask our, our wonderful panel um, you can also uh, answer our poll. Uh, the poll, which has been presented by Syngenta, is when thinking about making sustainability profitable on a farm, what, in your opinion, stands out as a priority to tackle? Um, so please submit your uh, answers to that poll and also tweet us at uh, hashtag Politico Sustainability. On to our panel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. In particular, Ra Rachel Kite, Dean Kite from uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Massachusetts, where it's particularly early. Uh, so thank you for being on our panel. Rachel was also uh, the UN D um, Secretary General's uh, Special Representative for Sustainable Energy for All before this job. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, Dragos Pishlau, who was uh, uh, going to join us. He's a Romanian MEP. He's taken ill at the last minute, so he sends his apologies, and he also sends us uh, his special advisor on all matters, uh, EU budget, and particularly the recovery and resilience facility from the pandemic. So Tana Farfa, thank you for joining us. And actually, as a journalist, uh, we all, always get more information when we talk to the advisors than we do from the politicians, so we're really looking forward to talking to you. Um, Petra Laux, thank you for joining us. Petra is the head of business sustainability at Syngenta for the European division. Um, so thank you to all of you. Uh, really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, I, I think it's clear that, at the very least, the COVID-19 pandemic has not... Uh, has not sated Europe's appetite for setting tough climate goals. Next week, the European uh, Council, the leaders, would, will meet and discuss raising Europe's climate target for 2030 to 55%. Uh, that's very much on the cards. So uh, with that, I just wanted to ask maybe Rachel, as a, as a kind of observer of the European Union and a close observer from the outside, was it that type of uh, ambition, a 55% goal, was that imaginable to you one year ago? Uh, well, it was hoped for, <clears throat> just like um, some of the ambition that's come out of uh, other parts of the world following uh, Europe's lead uh, was hoped for. But I'm, I'm not sure that a year ago at uh, the Climate Action Summit at the United Nations in September 2019, I'm not sure that the long-term goals uh, would have firmed up this way. Of course, EU is not out of the woods. Um, there's a hard-fought budget battle um, with the irony that the countries that need this budget uh, in order to be able to support their transition to uh, a low-carbon economy are those who are lined up to protest it at the moment. So I think the world is hoping that uh, this is resolved and that that 55% short-term target, 2030 target, is in place. That will be very important before December the 12th, which is the sort of ceremonial marking of five years of the Paris Agreement, where the UN at the moment thinks that they're going to have more than 70 countries coming forward with uh, you know, raised ambition. Of course, it was... Um, the joining of the EU with China, with the China with a 60% um, uh, reduction target, uh, a net zero, sorry, net zero by 2060 uh, statement that came just after Europe's announcement, uh, then knocking uh, Japan and uh, South Korea into making their net zero commitments for mid-century. And then, of course, followed by the election of Joe Biden in the United States. We, we look like we've got the beginning of a race to the top, which is what we need. And now we're all waiting to see what Boris Johnson will say as the COP26 president, as the leader of the negotiations. And, and the rumours are that he's going to come close to a 70% target for the UK, which scientists are saying that they should be at 68%. 70 is a nice round number. Maybe we don't get there. So the EU, despite the family fight inside, um, you know, really has kicked off this race. And I, I think the devil is in the detail, the devil is in the implementation and the execution of that. Uh, but it is difficult to uh, underestimate how important Europe's leadership's been over the last year. 
Tana, I wanted to get you to reflect upon that time as well and, and as someone who's been inside the, the legislative process in the council, what, has the, what was the raising of ambition during a pandemic and, and, the, and the kind of balancing of different interests within, within the European Parliament looked like to you? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me and I would like to uh, really apologize on, on behalf of uh, Dragos for not being uh, able to uh, be present today. Uh, he uh, really sends his apologies and uh, unfortunately it is not something that uh, he has uh, foreseen um, and uh, I really wish him uh, good health and to be uh, back uh, with us uh, soon because we need him of course in the, in the negotiations of the recovery and resilience facility. Um, so, um, coming back to uh, to your question, um, indeed, one would say that when we when we think about about recovery and when we speak about uh, um, in, in particular in this context of the pandemic, if we refer to recovery, one would uh, rather immediately point towards the uh, economic and social recovery after the pandemic. But the reality is that uh, we are uh, currently facing a world in which we uh, need to tackle the challenges uh, and recovering from something me means also that you need to reform uh, what uh, you have not managed to do so far. So you will have to improve the measures and the policies that you are not able to, uh, to tackle so far and also to invest in your future so that you are able to, uh, to increase a bit uh, the, the resilience uh, of the continent, which will of course lead to uh, the improvement of the, of the overall well-being. So they are all interlinked and um, this is why um, a recovery cannot be really envisaged without a containing the sustainability part in it. And this is why uh, the parliament um, had uh, raised a very high ambition uh, with regards to, to, the, to the climate targets. And uh, not only in, uh, um, in the, the legislation that we had uh, you know, expected it uh, to, to be, so when we refer, of course, to um, uh, the taxonomy regulation and we, uh, we refer to the Green Deal, but also in the Recovery and Resilience Facility. If we have a look at the, at the Parliament's proposal, which is of course now being negotiated uh, in, in trilogues with the, with the Council and the Commission, uh, you will see that uh, the Parliament proposed a structure of six pillars, uh, which are linked to six European priorities. The first pillar um, is the just green transition pillar. And I would really like to raise uh, the attention on this, uh, on this particular aspect because it's called the just green transition pillar, especially uh, first to put uh, the, the high target of, uh, of reaching the, um, the goals that we, that we have set, to have a clear spending of not only 37% for climate actions as uh, it, uh, it was envisioned by the commission, but actually 40%. So the parliament proposes 40% of the plans to be spent on climate and biodiversity actions. We propose an ambitious uh, tracking methodology and we really wish this, uh, this green transition to be a just one. So um, this would be, let's say, uh, the overall um, proposal that the parliament would like to make and this is how the, the parliament understands through the eyes of the of the co-rapporteurs that, that are uh, that are uh, doing an excellent job on this file um, to see a proper uh, recovery so a one that is uh, legitimate the one that is uh, comprehensive forward looking and most importantly sustainable yeah i wanted to pick up on this idea of the just transition with you um I, your your boss Dragos uh, has been one of a number of MPs who, um, and he's he's also the co-rapporteur on this on this file. But he's also um, one of a number of MPs who's pushing for certain derogations uh, for gas power within the within the recovery package, but only under very special circumstances. So to paraphrase, it's where there's really no other option to uh, put in renewables, where gas power would be replacing uh, more carbon intensive fuels like lignite or coal, um, peat. So I, I'm just wondering, first of all, I mean, I imagine that you would have had something to do with uh, that amendment and maybe drafting it. Um, so I, I'm curious about whether in the thinking from your side, there's actually specific places that you have in mind in Romania where those exact special circumstances would apply and where a gas power plant might be built? 
Um, well, uh, yes, I would like first of all to uh, to clarify uh, some uh, some aspects uh, related to this matter because I know that uh, um, there have been uh, uh, voices that uh, well uh, not not knowing of course the, the hidden uh, uh, the hidden background of, of the negotiations of this file in, in the parliament may be uh, entitled to uh, to see the things uh, as such, but I would uh, perhaps bring some light on uh, on this aspect. So I believe uh, that you refer to uh, to an amendment um, that was um, in the form of an, an annex that was linked to this recovery and resilience facility, which uh, was an amendment that was uh, put forward by all the three core rapporteurs. Um, and I would really like to, to highlight that because uh, I think it is important for, for us to, to see that the core rapporteurs uh, really worked together as a unified voice. So it did not matter whether the core rapporteur came from uh, uh, Romania or from uh, Spain. I'm referring here precisely to the recovery and resilience facility, of course. Uh, they, they really worked together and they thought about the general interest uh, of the European citizens, regardless where, where they are. Um, the the amendment that you you put uh, you you brought forward um, was um, putting uh, in into into a specific wording uh, and, and then trying to align the different provisions that are being uh, made in the in the JTM or in the JTF with the the possible or the, uh, the the eligible projects that say that could be envisaged under this facility. That was an annex that was created. Uh, in order to accommodate more than 2,000 amendments that we have received on this facility. And uh, the core rapporteurs really uh, try to be extremely comprehensive. But this annex uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not being uh, mentioned in any place in the final draft report of the European Parliament because the core rapporteurs have together agreed um, that uh, actually this type of list, uh, this open list will be subject to uh, to many, uh, you know, uh, differences, uh, not only in the House, but also in the negotiations. So they trusted fully the commission to come forward with guidances uh, that will explain to the member states what the um, what they should uh, invest and reform in now back to the to the regions uh, that uh, dragos pasaru um, is having in mind when we speak about just green transition well definitely coming from romania it is clear that there are uh, some specific um, regions that are um, coal dependent and that they need a proper uh, transition one that will be um, uh, sustainable in the sense of also helping people to um, reach their well-being there, we will need investment in the proper skills uh, and uh, an economy that will offer job opportunities for the people. People will need to be uh, to, to have reskilling and upskilling uh, strategies available uh, so that they are they are able to integrate on the new labor market. That's for sure. For that, there are uh, definitely uh, types of instruments that are uh, envisageable by by the member states uh, to to tackle them respectively and to to use them in those regions, um, but when negotiating on this file and uh, I, I really have to say because uh, um, you know detaching myself from uh, from the the work that I'm doing with Dragos but I have to say that I really admired uh, the professionalism that uh, that he uh, he um, showed throughout the negotiations without bringing uh, forward a particular uh, let's say uh, subjectivism when thinking about about the drafting so I really wanted to, to clarify this aspect thank you very much thank you it's I, I, the reason I bring it up is because I, I think we very quickly get away um, from when we talk about the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic one of the things is it has release this enormous amount of uh, public finance. And uh, and that is, as you say now, a lot of it is earmarked for climate action. Um, and what we're seeing also is a competition for that money and a, a competition to define essentially what is green. And I'm, I'm curious, Rachel, uh, having worked around the world, uh, you know, on trying to decide the best way to transition economies that are struggling um, from uh, either dirty energy or um, energy poverty to a, a cleaner, more sustainable um, way of, of powering the country. Where does gas come in? Because it is, it is really becoming one of those like pivot point issues in the EU as we, as we move through this, this discussion about the recovery. 
Well, so so gas, <clears throat> frankly, it depends where you are in the world, because it's either a short bridge to somewhere or an expensive bridge to nowhere. And I think the reality is that um, the gas infrastructure in some parts of the world can be used for a new green hydrogen economy. Uh, gas is uh, an essential part of the transition, but we have to be really clear that we have to be abating uh, emissions from that gas and we have to be aggressively stopping methane from leaking from that gas infrastructure and from our gas uh, sector. And so the cost of gas is not just the cost of gas. The cost of gas is gas with abatement. There's no way around that if we're going to meet uh, climate targets. So depending on where we are in the world and depending on um, what the political economy is, um, the role of gas in that transition is is as a transition and it's a question of not locking into things which are not going to be producing good quality jobs and not going to be create, producing uh, affordable energy uh, over the long run uh, and so political economy kicks in as well um, I think that the uh, the important thing to note is that there is widespread agreement uh, from all sort of economic commentators, from the OECD to the IMF to, to the International Energy Agency and, and universities across the European Union, that uh, the short-term need for relief means really making sure that good quality, uh, unskilled, semi-skilled and skilled jobs uh, are found in uh, the rehabilitation and refurbishment of the built environment that are found in building out the smart electricity infrastructure that we need for um, the world beyond the internal combustion engine, uh, for the kinds of smart grids and the uh, distributed energy uh, networks that we need. That there are many, many things that need to be done in the short term to produce the income and the growth that people need and give people the protection of having a good quality job. And that's fundamental to the just transition. And then there needs to be a, 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 an argument, which we, we've got at the moment, over how much are we going to be spending into new gas infrastructure? What is the plan for that gas infrastructure over the next 20 to 30 years? Why, where the relative merits of that versus other uh, for forms of an energy mix. And then there's the footprint of the European Union overseas as well. And uh, you know, really important discussions about whether uh, and how gas is a transition for uh, other parts of the world and where European industry fits into that. So uh, gas is part of a transition, but it, it, it is a bridge and uh, that bridge is shorter or longer, depending on where you are in the world and what other resource endowments you have and, and you know, what the political economy will allow for in terms of investment. Do you have a, a view on how short or long that bridge in uh, bridges in the EU specifically? Well, people will have to determine. I mean, this this is really what people will have to determine because it's going, as I said, you're going to have to pay for the abatement, which means you're going to have to pay for carbon capture, use and storage. You're going to have to pay for aggressive uh, measures to stop methane from being emitted. And you can pay for that. That may end up being more expensive than paying for other things. And, and that's really, uh, that. that's a political question. You know, there's norms within society about what we're prepared to pay for. And if people want to pay for gas and gas infrastructure because uh, that's where they believe um, you know, a, a political agreement can be reached within society, then so be it. But that, that may not be the cheapest option. There's also a, a, the other um, sort of really big political uh, fight that's going on in Brussels at the moment um, around uh, climate change and um, I, and and the and the way the politics is moving on climate change and the new targets that are being set and the European Green Deal is in agriculture. So I'm really glad that we've got you to speak to us, Petra. I'm, uh, th there's been a, an attempt to reform the cap from the European uh, Commission. Uh, their proposal went to Parliament uh, last month. It was it ran into some trouble um, with some of the eco schemes, the schemes that were uh, intended to uh, fund farmers to cut emissions, uh, a, there was a lot of pushback um, and certain exemptions were put on and loopholes and things like that. So I'm, I'm curious because farmers are, if we're talking about a just transition, farmers are going to be amongst the, the workers and businesses and companies most impacted by 
by climate change, by a warming planet, by in Europe we have drying, we have droughts, I, um, and all sorts of extreme weather impacts. So uh, I'm curious how you, how you see that, uh, that, that political play that's being made in Brussels at the moment and, 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 and why farmers are sort of pushing back against that cap reform. Thank you, Carl. And in, in fact, you rightly pointed out that farmers are very worried about climate change. We have asked our customers, and we found that in Europe, about 60% of farmers have already been impacted by climate change. About 80% of farmers believe that this will impact their profitability going forward. But also about 70% of farmers believe that, you know, being climate smart and sequestering carbon will make their farming more uh, competitive for the future. So for us, the question is, how, how can we make this work? And you're asking about the politics of this, um, Carl. So in, in essence, the technology is already there, right? So Zingenta, in its good growth plan, seeks to support farmers on fighting climate change. So what we do is two things. We help um, farmers mitigate the effects of climate change by providing better forecasts, by providing drought resistant seeds. And we help farmers minimize the impact of farming by promoting uh, climate smart farming practices and offering, for example, a nutrition deficient seeds. So, so there's a lot we can do, but why is this not happening? And it's actually not happening in bigger scale because there is no business model for sustainability at farm level yet. So the, the, what actually would need to happen is that we have a measurement tool to measure effectively the carbon sequestration and that we allow farmers to uh, bring the, their achievements forward to a market and being rewarded for it. So in, in principle, what you are um, telling us, it's, it's the right thing, you know, helping aligning subsidies, consumer choice, um, practices all towards the goal of climate change. I'm not really in a position to comment, you know, while uh, how, how farmers this is um, from what we know from talking to growers on the ground, they are very, very committed to dealing with climate change because it is, as I mentioned, starting out here, it is a key value for them for their future. But their lobby is uh, working against that in some ways, I would have thought, because there's, there's money on the table for farmers to, uh, to be investing in these types of more sustainable practices. There's another thing that I wanted to talk about with the European Commission's uh, vision for farming. Um, they've, they released their farm to fork uh, strategy in May. And it was, agriculture uh, accounts for roughly 10% of EU greenhouse gas emissions. So this is their attempt to begin to address uh, the emissions from this sector. In that strategy, uh, there was a, a reference, a, a target to cut fertilizer use by 20%. Now fertilizer use by some uh, estimates accounts for about half of agricultural emissions. These are your products, um, so are you, where, where are you on this 20% target? Do you think that's a good target? Do you think it's too high, too low? What's, the, what's your sense? So you're, you're pointing to the um, crucial role of agriculture and farming, right? It's about 10 to 12% of greenhouse gas emissions, but also uh, we, if agriculture is in a unique position because agriculture can also mitigate climate change. Yeah, There is the idea and the ideal that pro acre we can sequester one ton of CO2 per year over 30 years. So that's the massive opportunity we need to strive for. Now, with regards to the farm to fork strategy, you're asking, Carl, what do we think about these targets? We fundamentally support the vision of the European Commission for a greener agriculture. We believe we are not yet measuring the right thing. So for us, it's less about the process. It's less about fertilizer use. It's less about crop protection use. And by the way, Syngenta is offering crop protection products and seeds. We are in Europe not present in the fertilizer business. But nevertheless, you know, we, we strive to work towards measuring the outcomes. And when it comes to carbon farming, we were very encouraged actually by 
the releases of the intentions of DG Klima, who actually said they want to allow and establish a carbon credit market for farmers as of 2023. And this would actually allow foster and accelerate the move to climate friendly agriculture in Europe. I want to move on. These are two of the sort of big political issues that are rumbling around in Brussels. Um, but Rachel, in a global sense, the EU has this kind of ambition to export these values that it's laying out to the world and export its Green Deal. To do that effectively, can it just lead by example or what does it need to do? Uh, no, it has to be leading, um, you know, do as you do, not do as you say. Uh, but I think that there is a, a lot that the a lot that uh, the European Union is doing, uh, which um, stands as uh, a benchmark or at least the, the leadership. It, everything from the taxonomy on sustainable finance through to uh, the ambition that's in the Green Deal, etc. So. The, the argument about implementation is important. The argument over the budget is important. It will be important that Europe, the European Union is known as sort of being able to back up its ambition with its plans, because I think otherwise it makes it very difficult to to lead uh, compacts with, with other parts of the world. But, I mean, Europe is seen as a leader. And I think yesterday um, it was they published... Um, uh, a transatlantic, a vision of a transatlantic relationship for um, uh, for global change is what it's called. And embedded in that was climate as a, a way in which the European Union could reset the relationship with the United States. Uh, and it went through quite some detail in, in what is just a framework statement. Um, so I, I think the, the European Union's relationship with, with China, the European Union's relationship with um, with the United States are fundamental to success in continuing to ratchet up ambition with action over the next year. Uh, and then, of course, the European Union's footprint and its relationship with low-income countries and middle-income countries is also really important. And there, COVID um, has rolled 100 to 200 million people back into poverty in low-income countries. Uh, the pressure on the European Union to be able to help other countries through their transition is going to be uh, enormous. And we've even seen, for example, um, ideas coming out of the Economic Commission on Africa uh, around how to help low-income countries come through what is an indebtedness crisis uh, and, and be able to move through an energy transition and to get onto a greener pathway of growth. Uh, and, you know, one of the suggestions is actually that, you know, European central banks would repurchase African debt, allowing African countries then to make their investments in green infrastructure. So there's a, you know, it's the European Investment Bank has obviously become the climate bank. It is now the leading multilateral development bank when it comes to thinking through uh, the implications of climate change for development finance. Um, but these these frameworks will then actually have to be followed through with, with action. I think that's where we stand at the moment. Tana, for, for when there's discussions of, uh, you know, uh, debt, green debt swaps uh, for Africa and things like that, I, I do think about the fact that um, there are European countries uh, with debt crisis, crises of their own and, and you know, in difficult circumstances, enormous uh, populations of coal miners and communities that are facing really difficult transitions. How does that sound to, uh, to Romanians when they, when they hear talk from Western European capitals about uh, you know, providing that type of finance? Yes, well, uh, I believe. I mean, I, I was listening very, very carefully to what uh, to what Rachel was uh, was explaining, and I think uh, um, she she's right uh, with the fact that we could use indeed uh, this uh, this potential that uh, that we have if we um, manage, of course, to not only uh, have the ambition but also have the capacity to to you know to implement it, so to to uh, walk the talk. 
Um, and in this sense, I believe that the most uh, important um, uh, part on which we should work on uh, in the upcoming years would be to really build that resilience that we are looking for now. Because indeed, uh, not speaking only about the recovery post-pandemic, uh, we also need to consolidate our resilience. And if we manage to do that, uh, of course, that we will manage to uh, to send the, that strong message that we need on on the global scene, and we will be able to um, be taken uh, uh, proactively into account as the actor that is really implementing and and doing what uh, what they uh, what it says. Now. Um, Going back to the to the um, uh, to the transition uh, part uh, and the vulnerable regions that you that you were mentioning, um, which will be uh, of course affected during this uh, this transition towards a more green environment. Um, uh, Dragos Pazaru, he is uh, the Renew coordinator in the EMPL committee. Um, and from this position, uh, he has uh, for sure um, tried as much as possible to accommodate provisions in uh, in the specific uh, pieces of legislation that uh, that he had uh, with regards to how the um, um, not only the rights but the access to opportunity of those um, uh, people uh, could be still uh, you know not only respected but also. Um, um, exploited for their better future. And here we don't speak about uh, only about the, the regions, the vulnerable regions that we can witness in Romania, because there are uh, regions that are uh, co-dependent and uh, that will also have um, face a more uh, difficult transition uh, towards sustainability in, in other parts of, uh, of Europe. So we're not only referring to, to the uh, Eastern uh, Europe part, but also to the Central Europe. And there are also even regions uh, here in the Western Europe that, uh, that um, will need uh, major reform uh, and investments to be more sustainable. Um, it's true that uh, when communicating uh, towards the citizens, it is extremely important to translate what uh, uh, we are working on here in, uh, in Brussels, because otherwise uh, things can be indeed very misinterpreted. It is very easy for someone that uh, belongs to that region when uh, they read the, the news in Brussels and they, uh, uh, they look at those climate targets that we have to, uh, to be scared and uh, to, to not know what it will happen with them in the future, to uh, to realize that it means that the, the coal mine that have been uh, they have been working in will will close very soon, so they will lack uh, a, a job. They will no longer have any uh, prospects for the future. So this is why uh, it is extremely uh, important and essential um, for uh, for the the MEPs and in, in general for the um, political uh, decision makers to uh, really communicate accordingly and to. Um, make the necessary provisions, not only at the European level, but also at national level, to uh, prepare those regions for the transition. Be because I, I don't think that it is uh, enough, and that's that's my my personal view, but it is not enough only to have the... I'm going to have uh, to jump in because we've only got a minute left, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take that as a closing statement. Yes, yes please, please. <clears throat> and a brilliant closing statement. Um, I just wanted to reflect back uh, the result of our poll, which has essentially said that the... the biggest priority uh, for sustainable uh, farming, profitable farming, is to have incentives for the common agricultural policy um, aligned with sustainable farming practices. So I, I just wanted to, just a word from you, Petra, um, is that going to be like a big priority for Syngenta this year to, to, to bring those two things closer together? So the priority for Syngenta is to enable farmers to capture carbon and to possibly also make a business with this. Because only if the incentives are aligned at farming level, you know, we will sustainably move forward. Thank you. And I'm going to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we've got a, a lunch break coming up uh, for uh, an hour now. Um, so have, uh, have a relax. Um, there's going to be a thought provoking discussion on the future of supply chains with Frank Reister, France's Minister Delegate for Foreign Trade and Economic Attractiveness, um, the most French political uh, title you could imagine. Um, and after that, uh, Philippe Luscan, Executive Vice President of Global Industrial Affairs at Sanofi, will join us. Um, so in the meantime, join the app, book meetings with your peers, have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you again to our panel.